on answers. But I think I would have been better off had I stayed at home. Enough of that, though. I find myself at a loss. You've got a whole fortress now. I suppose I should start plying my trade again. I might use the peak as a base of operations. So many bandits about, but none would dare come here. Nice place to store trade goods. You, of course, will get a sizable discount. Looks like we're done here. A demonic invasion thwarted, a warden base safely rescued. We do good work. As you say. Yes. Yes, indeed. Will you stop eating? I'm hungry. Stuff your face at camp. For now, watch the bloody road.
But we've been looking at the road for hours. No travelers all day. Will one of you pay attention? Oi! Who's that? be done.
do your father proud, my lord. Certainly. Task? As you say.
Very well. Shall be done. As you say.
begun. I shall do it.
times. We have much to do.
immediately. Task? Yes.
It has begun. I know not how you have survived thus far. Is it luck or providence? No matter. You will not survive this!
and your friends are formidable folk, indeed. It's good to have you along on the road. I'm sure you'll be pleased with the goods my boy and I have collected, and with your discount. Something on your mind? You don't have to do that. I know you didn't know him as long as I did. I... I should have handled it better. Duncan warned me right from the beginning that this could happen. Any of us could die in battle. I shouldn't have lost it, not when so much is riding on us, not with the blight and... and everything. I'm sorry. I'd like to have a proper funeral for him. Maybe once this is all done, if we're still alive. 
I don't think he had any family to speak of. I don't know. I have no idea what the Grey Wardens do for them when they fall in battle. Dwarves don't practice cremation, do they? How do your people honor your dead? I heard about that, now that I think about it. Their spirits return to the rock, strengthening the foundation of the Tige. It sounds so strange. I suppose you're right. Thank you. It was good to talk about this with a friend. <laughs> It means a lot to me. Something on your mind? Of course. Such as they are. That's a good question. There's plenty in Orlais, but who knows where they might be found. And the nearest Orlesian city is weeks away. If we go north and cross the sea, there's bound to be some in the free marches. Again, however, I just don't know where. I don't know anything about Grey Wardens in other lands. Here in Ferelden, there's our compound in Denerim at the palace, but that's it. Loghain will have control over that and be watching it, no doubt. Beyond that, the only place I know of is Weishaupt Fortress. That's the headquarters of all Grey Wardens in the Anderfelds, a thousand miles from here. But I've no idea how to even contact them. So unless we try to get back to the compound in Denerim, I suppose the answer is no. There's nowhere for us to go. I imagine that eventually the Grey Wardens outside of Ferelden will wonder what's happened. Why there's no contact from Duncan or someone. They'll send someone eventually. Though who knows what Loghain's people in Denerim will tell them. Maybe they won't send anyone. We could try to contact them. But that would mean leaving Ferelden. And even if we did, they couldn't come back with us in time to stop the Blight. So that means whatever happens, it's up to us. I mean, eventually we would have to use the joining to make more Grey Wardens, right? But I don't know how to do the joining, or what's involved. I know it involves lyrium and some other magic, and it's really difficult to prepare, but that's it. Unless we can find out more about the joining, I guess we better get used to the idea that there might only be two of us for now. Until more come from elsewhere. Just left? You mean, just left for Elven? I don't know. If there's an Archdemon, however, we're supposed to be the only ones who can defeat it. And that means the Blight would grow unchecked. Eventually, other Grey Wardens in Orlais and other lands would hear about it, and they would come to fight it, but they wouldn't come in time to save Ferelden. There's no way. I'm not going anywhere. About the Grey Wardens, anyhow. Fair enough. Something on your mind? Of course. Same way you did. You drink some blood, you choke on it, and pass out. You haven't forgotten already, have you? Let's see. I was in the Chantry before. I trained for many years to become a Templar, in fact. That's where I learned most of my skills. <laughs> well, it wasn't an easy life, you know. 
I don't know whether or not you've noticed, but I'm not exactly the Chantry type. The Grand Cleric didn't want to let me go. Duncan was forced to conscript me, actually. And was she ever furious when he did? I thought she was going to have us both arrested. I was lucky. I wondered that myself. It's not as if she valued me highly. I think she just didn't want to give anything to the Grey Wardens, is all. The Chantry didn't lose much. And I think I can do more fighting the Blight anyhow, rather than sitting in a temple somewhere. I'll always be thankful to Duncan for recruiting me. If it hadn't been for him, you know, I would never... I wouldn't have. No, it's... Uh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't be... It's fine. He died a hero. They all did. Come on, let's go. I think I'm done talking. Is something on your mind? Of course. Did I say that? I meant that dogs raised me. Giant slobbering dogs from the Anderfells. A whole pack of them, in fact. Oh, there you go, listening to me again. You'd think you'd have gotten past that already. I ended up in the Chantry, sure, but I didn't start there. Let's see, how do I explain this? I'm a bastard. And before you make any smart comments, I mean the fatherless kind. My mother was a serving girl in Redcliffe Castle, who died when I was very young. Arleman wasn't my father, but he took me in anyhow, and put a roof over my head. He was good to me, and he didn't have to be. I respect the man, and I don't blame him anymore for sending me off to the Chantry once I was old enough. Arleman eventually married a young woman from Orlais which caused all sorts of problems between him and the king because it was so soon after the war. But he loved her. Anyhow, then you, Arlesa, resented the rumors which pegged me as his bastard. They weren't true, but of course they existed. The Isle didn't care, but she did. So off I was packed to the nearest monastery at age 10, just as well. The Arlesa made sure the castle wasn't a home to me by that point. She despised me. Maybe. She felt threatened by my presence, I can see that now. I can't say I blame her. She wondered if the rumors were true herself, I bet. I remember I had an amulet, with Andraste's holy symbol on it. The only thing I had of my mother's. I was so furious at being sent away, I tore it off and threw it at the wall and it shattered. Stupid, stupid thing to do. The Isle came by the monastery a few times to see how I was, but I was stubborn. I hated it there. I blamed him for everything. And eventually, he just stopped coming. And raised by dogs. Or I may as well have been, the way I acted. <laughs> yeah, but maybe all young bastards act like that. I don't know. All I know is that the Arl is a good man, and well-loved by the people. He also was King Caelan's uncle, so he has a personal motivation to see Loghain pay for what he did. Anyway, that's really all there is to the story. Something on your mind? Of course. <laughs> Have you seen the uniform? It's not only stylish, but well made. I'm a sucker for good tailoring. That's just in public. In private, we have these yellow and purple tunics, right? Much more comfortable, and you don't break the beds when you jump on them during a pillow fight.
Uh, pillow fights? I mean, no, of course not. I meant sword fights. <laughs> with rusty swords, dripping with acid. The kind that puts hair on your chest. You don't really want to know about my being a Templar, do you? It's really quite boring. Poke, poke, poke. Tell me everything about your life, Alistair. All right, if you insist. It's not like we have anything better to do, right? The truth of the matter is that I did hate going to the monastery. The initiates from poor families thought I put on airs, while the noble ones called me a bastard and ignored me. I felt like Al Eamon had cast me off unwanted, and I was determined to be bitter. But I took some solace in the training itself, I guess. I was actually quite good at it. The education, mostly, but also the discipline. You need to have a disciplined mind in order to use the abilities we have. It was difficult, but rewarding. I never really felt at home anywhere, though, until I joined the Grey Wardens. And Duncan felt my Templar abilities might be useful for when we encountered Darkspawn magic, so I kept it up. What about you? Do you have anywhere you consider home? But it's not your home anymore, right? You can never go back for good. I think I understand how you feel. We won't always be traveling like this, you know. Once the war is over, once the blight is... Well, a time will come when we'll have to think about having a real home again. Though that seems like a far ways off. And I suppose... The Grey Wardens are gone for good, either way. I suppose you're right. We can create new Grey Wardens, but we'll never get back those we lost. No wonder it would ever feel the same. Anyhow, now I've sidetracked us. We'd better get back to what we're supposed to be doing right now. Something on your mind? Of course. You mean other than becoming a Grey Warden? Hmm. You know, I asked Duncan this too. And all I got was, you'll see... Oh, it's not that Duncan wants to keep it a secret, it's just that the Grey Wardens don't discuss it much. I gather it's not a pleasant topic. The first change I noticed was an increase in appetite. I used to get up in the middle of the night and raid the castle larder. I thought I was starving. I'd slurp down every dinner like it was my last, and <laughs> my face all covered in gravy. When I'd look up, the other Grey Wardens would stare, then laugh themselves to tears. Really? I saw you eating dinner the other day. Savage. Ah yes, the classy camaraderie of two men traveling out in the open. I take it you were like this before the joining then. Oh, and then there were the nightmares. Duncan said it was part of how we sensed the darkspawn. We tap into their, well, I don't know what you call it, their group mind. And when we sleep, it's even worse. You learn to block it out after a while, but at first it's hard. It's supposed to be worse for those who join during a blight. How is it for you? Some people never have much trouble, but that's rare. Others have trouble sleeping their entire life. They're just more sensitive, I suppose. Everyone ends up the same. Once you reach a certain age, the real nightmares come. That's how a Grey Warden knows his time has come. Oh, that's right. We never had time to tell you that part, did we? Well, in addition to all the other wonderful things about being a Grey Warden, 
You don't need to worry about dying from old age. You've got 30 years to live. Give or take. The taint. It's a death sentence. Ultimately, your body won't be able to take it. When the time comes, most Grey Wardens go to Orzammar and die in battle rather than waiting. It's tradition. You'll always find Darkspawn down where the Dwarves are. The oldest Grey Wardens head to the Deep Roads for one last glorious battle. Not that there's a shortage of Darkspawn during the Blight, but that's the tradition. The Dwarves respect us for it. And you wondered why we kept the joining a secret from the new recruits. And there you have it. I suppose it is. We're the only ones who can stop the Blight, however. Is there a price too high to pay for that? You know, Duncan... He started having the nightmares again. He told me that in private. He said it wouldn't be long before he'd go to Orzammar himself. I guess he got what he wanted. I just wish it had been something worthy of him. Ending the blight should make this all worthwhile, right? Something on your mind? Of course. I didn't know them for very long, but I guess it was longer than you. You never met them all, did you? They were quite a group. Actually, they felt like an extended family, since we were all cut off from our former lives. We also laughed more than you'd think. There was this one time... Well, you probably don't want to hear stories about men you didn't know. There was one Grey Warden who came all the way from the Anderfels. What was his name? Was Gregor... Gregor... He was a burly man with the biggest, fuzziest beard you've ever seen. And the man could drink. He drank all the time, but he never got drunk. Finally, we all made a pool to see just how many pints it would take to put him under the table. Sometimes, we were kin of a sort. All of us had gone through the joining, so we knew... Anyhow, it doesn't have to be deadly serious all the time. Anyhow, we never did find out. He said he'd drink a pint for every half pint that the rest of us drank. He was still going by the time the rest of us were passed out. I'm told that Duncan walked in later on and saw us all passed out from one end of the hall to the other, and Gregor still drinking. <laughs> Duncan laughed until he nearly... Until... Yes, I... I suppose so. I thought I was done with this, but... It just struck me that I have nothing to remember Duncan by. Nothing at all. There's no body, not even a token of his that I could... take with me. That must sound really stupid to you. I just would have liked something of his to take with me, that's... Well, there's no use in moaning about it, is there? He's gone. Let's just go. I'm wondering something. I'd like to know your thoughts about some of our traveling companions. Do you mind if I ask? I've got this nefarious plan to go around to each of them and secretly tell them all the nasty things you said. That way they'll mutiny and I shall become the group leader. <laughs> what? Lead? Me? No, 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 no leading. Bad things happen when I lead. We get lost, people die, and the next thing you know I'm stranded somewhere, without any pants. 
Seriously though, I'm only curious. I've had enough time to form my own opinions, and I just want to see if yours are any different. Just try and stop me. Let's see, where should I begin? Zevran, the elf. You can't trust him, can you? Do you believe his so-called vow? That's a lot to put on a maybe, isn't it? He's an assassin. The crows aren't known for giving up. Maybe he's just biding his time. Hmm. Well, if you are, then maybe I should too. But that doesn't mean I won't keep an eye on him. He's just too shifty. What about Sten? The way he looks at me with those eyes. Creepy. And he's so quiet for someone so big. Yet he doesn't seem quite so bad as the Chantry tells us. According to them, his philosophy is vile and evil. Yet he seems so reasonable. And yet... He killed all those people. He doesn't even deny it. Doesn't that bother you? Hmm. I'm not so sure that his regret means the same as it would for us. The Kunari sense of honor is... It's a bit hard to grasp. For me, anyway. What about Liliana? Is she crazy? Or do you really believe in her vision? Even the Chantry believes that most claims of visions and such are usually people's minds playing tricks on them. Wishful thinking at best. I'm not sure what I think. Maybe you're right. It's not as if she could have known that we needed help so desperately after all. Yet, there she was. I don't know what to make of her. You look at her when she doesn't see you. She just looks so... so sad. I almost feel guilty taking her away from her life. Yes, I know. Still, I feel badly for her. Morrigan, do you trust her? Think about it. Maybe Flemeth sent her with us for some other reason than she said. And you're just going to let her follow us around? A Malefica and make her knows what else? It is not. All right, maybe it is a little. You may have a point. Enough. I think my curiosity is sated. Let's get back to it, shall we? Something on your mind? Of course. Never, never what? Had a good pair of shoes? Oh, so that's what we're talking about. <laughs> well, if you really want to know, you tell me first. And apparently you have no shame as well. <laughs> well, all right, I'll play along. I myself never had the pleasure. Not that I haven't thought about it, of course. But, you know.
Well, living in the Chantry is it's not exactly a life for rambunctious boys. They they raised me to be a gentleman. That's not so bad, is it? I've uh, no urge to rush into anything. We, we may not even survive what is to come, after all. Enough. I don't want to talk about this anymore. Let's go. Something on your mind? Of course. Such as they are. About the Grey Wardens, anyhow. Fair enough. Something on your mind? Of course. Essentially, they're trained to fight. The Chantry would tell you that the Templars exist simply to defend. But don't let them fool you. They're an army. The other main purpose for a Templar is, of course, to hunt mages. To that end, we train in talents that drain mana and disrupt spells. You could call it that, sure. The Chantry doesn't look on it the same way, however, since really our talents only work on mages. Against a regular person, I'm just a guy in a metal suit. No, I never actually became a full Templar. Duncan recruited me before I took my vows. I was only present during one harrowing. The ritual that they test the mages with. It's not unlike our joining, really. And... Just as deadly. The girl they tested, she had a demon put inside her. To see if she could resist. And she couldn't. We had to... End it quickly. I have to say I didn't have much interest in becoming a Templar after that. Perhaps. But there usually isn't much of an opportunity. The Chantry keeps a close rein on its Templars. We are given Lyrium to help develop our magical talents, you see. Which means we become addicted. And since the Chantry controls the Lyrium trade with the Dwarves, well, I'm sure you can put two and two together. Thankfully, no. You only start receiving Lyrium once you've taken your vows. You don't need Lyrium in order to learn the Templar talents. Lyrium just makes Templar's talents more effective. Or so I was told. Maybe it doesn't even do that. The Chantry usually doesn't let their Templars get away either, so they can spread their secrets. I'm a bit of an exception. Lucky me. Something on your mind? Of course. Others, yes, but not yourself. I need someone who's trained first as a warrior. It's as much about discipline as anything. I guess if I'm going to give up Chantry secrets, I may as well go all the way. Send whoever you want trained to me in camp, and I'll see what I can do. Fine gift. You have my thanks. I have a thought. We have an opportunity that I believe we should take advantage of. To the point. My mother was once divested of a particular grimoire by a most annoying Templar hunter. It occurred long before I was born, but even today, Flemeth speaks of the loss with great rage. With the circle of magi in such disarray, it occurs to me that this might be the perfect time to recover the tome from their possession, for surely it eventually ended up in their hands?
here's a book of spells of the sort that Flemeth has dabbled with throughout her long life. Tis not the sort of thing that would benefit a mage of the standard variety. They were taught a different path. I, however, was taught by my mother. I know a way around the wards my mother would have placed on such a tome. I know the language that she would have written it in. I would find such a tome most useful. Useful in the way that it might increase my power. Useful in the way that I would become more useful to you. Does that not follow? Good. I am most interested to see its contents, should it be located. The grimoire is leather-bound and adorned with the symbol of a leafless tree, should you come across it. If not, however, then I shall simply put it out of my mind. I await your command. So, full of questions, are you? <laughs> Why do you ask me such questions? I do not probe you for pointless information, do I? Beg pardon then, while I jump for joy. What is it you asked if I grew up in the wilds? A curious question. Where else would you picture me? For many years it was simply Flemeth and I. The wilds and its creatures were more real to me than Flemeth's tales of the world of man. In time, I grew curious. I left the wilds to explore what lay beyond, never for long. Brief forays into a civilized wilderness. For the most part, Flemeth taught me well. For all that I had been taught, however, the truth of the civilized lands proved to be... overwhelming. I was unfamiliar with so much. So confident and bold was I, yet there was much that Flemeth could never have prepared me for. <laughs> Equal parts daring and foolhardy, perhaps. Only once was I accused of being a witch of the wilds, and that by a chastened who happened to be travelling with a merchant caravan. He pointed and gasped and began shouting in his strange language, and most assumed he was casting some curse upon me. I acted the terrified girl, and naturally, he was arrested. Men are always willing to believe two things about a woman. One, that she is weak, and two, that she finds him attractive. I played the weakling and battered my eyelashes at the captain of the guard. <laughs> Child's play. The point being that I was able to move through human lands fairly easily. Whatever humans think a witch of the wild looks like, tis not I. Not that I did not have trouble. There are things about human society which have always puzzled me, such as the touching. Why all the touching for a simple greeting? To begin with, yes. What is the point of touching my hand? I find it an offensive intrusion. There were many nuances that Flemeth could never tell me of. When to look into another's eyes. How to eat at a table. How to bargain without offending. None of these things I knew. I still do not understand it all, truth be told. But then I gave up long ago any hope of doing so. When I returned to the wilds last, I swore to Flemeth that I had no intention of leaving again. I have no qualm with the mission I have been set to. Flemeth was correct, like it or not, the Darkspawn are an enemy of all. 
Well, let's get on with it before the ground opens up and swallows us, yes? Yes? So, full of questions, are you? <laughs> <laughs> you are very cute to ask so many questions. Of course I don't. It is no matter. My mother has been haunted from time to time, yes. By Templar fools like Alistair, which should tell you how successful they generally were. Flemeth made a bit of a game of it, in fact. The Templars would come again, and she would look at me and smile and say that the fun was to begin once more. I am unsure. I was too young to understand, and perhaps it was bravado on Flemeth's part, or perhaps she was merely amused. I will never know. Flemeth would warn them once. It was a warning they inevitably failed to heed. And then the true game began. Often Flemeth would use me as bait, <laughs> a little girl to scream and run and lure the Templars deeper into the wilds and to their doom. It was a game and I a young girl. If I didn't get to play, I would have been very upset. Thankfully, the wilds is a vast place. Once they found us, Flemeth would simply move us elsewhere and we would be lost within the forest once again. I did not understand the danger we faced until I was much older. I had never heard of apostates or maleficarum. You do not know. The zealots use that word for any magic they do not control. The Chantry sees any mages not leashed to the Circle of Magi as apostates, and apostates could become Maleficarum, evil mages that resort to blood magic and become demon-enslaved abominations. It may even be true, still, those of us who prefer freedom see no reason to submit. Thank you for small favors, then, at the very least. Enough of this talk. Let us return to the task at hand. Yes? So, full of questions, are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, that depends, does it not? What does she seem to be? <laughs> oh, she is certainly old. Have no mistake of that. Tell me, how much do you know of the tale? The one that the chastened still tell of my mother, to frighten them into obedience. Ah, I see. That does explain much. I can relay what Flemeth once told me herself, and you can decide whether or not tis the truth, if you desire. As the tale is sung by the bards, there was a time when Flemeth was young and beautiful, a fair lass in a land of barbarian men, the desire of any who saw her. many centuries before this land was even named Ferelden. The tales say that Flemeth fell in love with Osin the Bard and fled the castle of her husband, the dreadlord Conobar, and that he swore vengeance for her infidelity. In truth, my mother claims that twas Osin who was her husband and Conobar the jealous lord who looked on from afar. 
Lord Conobar approached young Osen and offered him wealth and power in exchange for his lovely wife. And Osen agreed. The life of a bard is a poor one, and love fades in the wake of hunger. It was Flemeth who suggested the arrangement. All would have been well had Lord Conobar kept his end of the bargain. But he was a foul man who bargained with coin he did not possess. Osen was led off to a field and slain, left for dead. Flemeth spoke to the spirits and learned of the deed, and swore revenge. Spirits first, and twas they who slew Conobar. Flemeth did not turn to the demon until... much later. Lord Conobar's allies chased Flemeth, you see. Chased her to the wilds, and there she hid. There she found the demon, and he made her strong. The legends all speak of the great hero Cormac, he who defeated Flemeth and her great army when she invaded the lowlands centuries later. All lies. The truth of the matter is that there was never an invasion. As Flemeth tells it, the Chastened never raised an army under her banner, and she never fought with any warrior named Cormac. Cormac led a brutal civil war against his own people, and later claimed it was to vanquish evil that had taken root amongst the Lords. Thus, he was hailed a hero. Flemeth was only attached to the legend much later. Perhaps it was due to the great war with the Chastened that eventually came, but Mother claims not to know how it began. I do not believe everything that Flemeth claims. Often it seems her bitterness has colored her memories. But on the whole, yes, I believe this tale, if not all. The demon within her has transformed her into something else. An abomination, perhaps, some would say. I know not. I only know my mother is clever, and she is part of the wilds as it is part of her. But she is no immortal. She bleeds. A blade in her heart would kill her like any other were it lucky enough to find her. You ask if I have sisters? I have asked of this myself. The stories tell of many witches of the wilds, after all, not just the one. And these tales existed long before I did. Flemeth refuses to speak of other daughters, if they existed. So, should I believe I am her first? I doubt that too. The Chastened tell of a falling out between Flemeth and her daughters. They say that one day she hunted them all through the wilds and ate their hearts. It may be true. I have never seen another witch or heard of one. Perhaps one day Flemeth will eat my heart as well. How often is this usually? Always? If not always, then when is it not true? There are more things in this world and the next than you or I could ever hope to understand. What Flemeth became is a mystery, I suspect, even to her. Flemeth tells it with far more embellishment than I, but you are welcome. Dare I ask of your own mother? Few are abominations of legend, it is true, but I find myself curious nevertheless. Ah, oh, then you have my sympathies for what it is worth. Which is very little, I am certain. It matters not. Let us move on. It is cold in my tent, all alone.
<laughs> Why, it just so happens that I find you quite warm. Come now, my Grey Warden. Must it be so complicated? Is there any reason not to? Ah, oh, that is too bad. I await your command. So, oh, full of questions, are you? <laughs> I assume you were actually asking whether Flemeth herself gave birth to me. Truly? I do not know. I once asked Flemeth that very question and she merely laughed at me. It is not inconceivable that she could capture a chastened man, or perhaps change to a more attractive form to attract him willingly. I find it more difficult to imagine her with child. As a matter of fact, I remember her being younger once. She had black hair, much like my own, long and lustrous. But how could that be if she is centuries old? Has she become wizened only recently? Or are the tales of her legend only that, and nothing more? I do know the tales of Flemeth having many daughters, even though I have never met another. And Flemeth has always treated me as her blood. Must one be a doting and simpering moron to be considered a suitable mother? Flemeth taught me everything I needed to learn. How to survive, the meaning of power, the truth of men. If other mothers do not teach these things, then I believe them the lesser. You suppose it's true? Tis true. To indulge in love is to indulge in delusion, surely. Cold in my tent, all alone. <laughs> Why, it just so happens that I find you. Come now, my Grey Warden. Must it be so... Oh. I await your command. So, full of questions. I... Truly, it is not inconceivable that she could capture a chastened man. Or perhaps... As a matter of fact... But how could that be if she is... I do know the tales of Flemeth having many daughters, even though I have never met another. And Flemeth has always treated me as her blood. <laughs> what an odd thing to say! Why must love enter into the equation? Flemeth taught me everything I needed to learn. How to survive, the meaning of power, the truth of men. If other mothers do not teach these things, then I believe them the lesser. Room for coddling and weakness? Why should such things be desirable? To indulge in love is to indulge in delusion. Surely a Grey Warden such as yourself does not believe otherwise. And I am glad to hear it. I await your command. So, full of questions, are you? <laughs> I await your command. At times, perhaps, a world full of people and buildings and things was all very foreign to me. If I wished companionship, I ran with the wolves and flew with the birds. If I spoke, 
was to the trees. What did I have to compare it with? In time, I began to wonder, of course. I recall the first time I crept beyond the edge of the wilds. I did so in animal form, remaining in the shadows and watching these strange townsfolk from afar. I happened upon a noblewoman by her carriage, adorned in sparkling garments the likes of which I had never before seen. I was dazzled. This, to me, seemed what true wealth and beauty must be. I snuck up behind her and stole a hand mirror from the carriage. It was encrusted in gold and crystalline gemstones, and I hugged it to my chest with delight as I sped back to the wilds. Flemeth was furious with me. I was a child and had not yet come into my full power, and I had risked discovery for the sake of a pretty bauble. To teach me a lesson, Flemeth took the mirror and smashed it upon the ground. I was heartbroken. And a foolish one. Flemeth was right to break me of my fascination. Beauty and love are fleeting and have no meaning. Survival has meaning. Power has meaning. Without those lessons I would not be here today, as difficult as they might have been. They did indeed. To return to your original question, perhaps my time in the wilds was indeed lonely, but such was how it had to be. I find myself at times wondering what might have become of the girl with the beautiful golden mirror, but such fantasies have no place amidst reality. I await your command. We are in camp, so tis as good a time as any. I await your command. So, full of questions, are you? <laughs> I was not born such. Tis a skill of Flemeth's, taught over many years in the wilds. The chastened have tales of we witches, saying that we assume the forms of creatures to watch them from hiding. When a child is alone and separate from his tribe, that is when we strike, dragging the young boy kicking and screaming to our lair to be devoured. A most amusing legend. So I assume my mother has walked the wilds far longer than I. Who am I to suggest what things she has done and not done in her past? Why do you ask? Is there something specific you wish to know? The form of an animal is different from my own. One may study the creature, learn to move as it does, think as it does. In time, this allows one to become as it is. I gain nothing by studying another human. I already am the same as they are. I learn nothing. So the answer is no, my human form is the only one I possess. Anyone with sufficient will. But the act of transformation is a magical one. It is a spell and thus requires a mage's talents. If you had a notion to learn such a skill for yourself, sadly, you must remain disappointed. There were nights when the wilds called to me, it is true. You look upon the world around you and you think you know it well. I have smelled it as a wolf, listened as a cat, prowled shadows that you never dreamed existed. But my life is as a human, I am under no illusions to the contrary. They do not shy away from me. To their senses, I believe I seem like any other of their species. As to what they think, I truly cannot say. Just as I am still human, no matter my form, they are still animals. Thus they cannot speak, even were I to ask. No? 
tis not unheard of in the remote corners of the world. There are traditions of magic outside of the Circle of Magi, despite what those mages would have you believe. Some of these traditions are old, indeed, passed down as carefully guarded law from one generation to the next. The zealots of the Chantry would uproot all such practitioners if they could. But as luck have it, some still exist. My mother is such a one. I am surprised you think so. Still, it is a pleasant thing to hear. Indeed. Have you an opinion on my abilities, then? Am I an unnatural abomination to be put to the torch? You're simply full of surprises, little man, aren't you? But enough of such talk, let us proceed lest the dust gather on us. I await your command. So, oh, full of questions, are you? <laughs> I cannot teach you, no, but any other mages that cared to learn, yes, I could do that. Send whoever you wish my way, and I shall teach them what I can in the camp, provided they possess the will to even make the attempt. You're back. You need something? I don't know what you mean. You should keep your voice down. People might get the wrong idea. Better trade cities to the north, but plenty good trade here. Now with war and blight, business is bad. Oh, yes. Father proud, my lord. Certainly. Thank <laughs> you. 
Await your command. So, full of questions. What? You found Flemeth's grimoire? But when I spoke of it to you, I did not truly hope... <gasps> this is a most fortuitous event. You have my thanks. I will begin study of the tome immediately. Secrets. My mother has many of them, and this tome represents the one time that they were able to get away from her. I do not intend to squander this opportunity to learn more than Flemeth wished me to know. This should be... interesting. to invest in the effectiveness of your followers. Yes? Well, here I am. What is meant by someone like me? And there were no beautiful, charming women in the cloisters, you think? <laughs> you would be wrong. There were many lovely young initiates in the Lothering Cloister. All of them chaste and virtuous. <laughs> it added to their mystique. Because then, there were forbidden, and forbidden fruit is the sweeter, no? Flatterer. I, however, did not take vows, and so perhaps I am not as enigmatic? The Chantry provides succor and safe harbor to all who seek it. I chose to stay and become affirmed. We affirm our belief in the Maker, in Andraste and the Chant, but other than that, there are no vows taken. I was a traveling minstrel in Orlais. Tales and songs were my life. I performed, and they rewarded me with applause and coin. And my skill in battle? Well, you pick up different skills when you travel, yes? Yes, of course. Um, let's move on. Yes? Something you need? Yes? What's on your mind? I knew this would come up sooner or later. I don't know how to explain, but I had a dream. In it, there was an impenetrable darkness. It was so dense, so real. 
and there was a noise, a terrible, ungodly noise. I stood on the peak and watched as the darkness consumed everything. And when the storm swallowed the last of the sun's light, I... I fell, and the darkness drew me in. I suppose I did. That was what the darkness was, no? When I woke, I went to the Chantry's gardens, as I always do. But that day, the rose bush in the corner had flowered. Everyone knew that bush was dead. It was grey and twisted and gnarled, the ugliest thing you ever saw. But there it was, a single beautiful rose. It was as though the maker stretched out his hand to say, even in the midst of this darkness, there is hope and beauty. Have faith. In my dream, I fell, or, or maybe I jumped. I'd do anything to stop the blight. I know that we can do it. There are so many good things in the Maker's world. How can I sit by while the blight devours everything? That is why you are a Grey Warden. Come, there's a blight to stop. Yes? Something you need? Yes? What's on your mind? Quiet. It was a life suited for contemplation. In the cloister, away from the fuss and the flurry of the cities, I found peace. And in that stillness, I could hear the Maker. But it was not perfect. Some of my Chantry fellows were condescending. That is the nature of religious folk, I suppose. When I talked about my beliefs, that the Maker reveals himself in the beauty of his world, they treated me with disdain. They want to believe that he's gone, so that when he turns his gaze on them, it means they are special, chosen. He cannot possibly have love for all, the sick and the weary, the beggars and the fools. Thank you. Maybe I am wrong. But it is the Maker's place to decide if I am worthy, not men, not the Chantry. But there is work to be done, and I have talked enough for now. Yes? Something you need? Yes? What's on your mind? My mother was from Denerim, and I consider myself a Ferelden. Mother served an Orlesian noblewoman who lived here when Orle ruled. When Orle was defeated and the common folk began to resent the presence of any Orlesian, the lady returned to Orle. She took my mother with her. I was born in Orle and did not set foot in Ferelde until much later. Mother was always telling me stories of her homeland. I think she missed it. Mother died when I was very young. Lady Cecily let me stay with her. I had no one else. She was quite old then, and she had me study music and dance to entertain her. It is unfair that I have more memories of Cecily than my mother. Strangely, the only thing I really remember of Mother was her scent. She kept dry flowers in her closet amongst her clothes. Small white Ferelden and wildflowers with a sweet fragrance. Mother called them Andraste's Grace. They were very rare in Orle. But enough about that. Let us move on. Yes? Something you need? Yes? What's on your mind? I miss Valroyo. Unlike other cities where the people are the lifeblood and the character, Val Royau was her own person, and her people little more than decorations. There was always music in Val Royau, 
streaming from the many windows, quiet refrains and triumphant choruses, and always floating above that all, the chant, coming from the Grand Cathedral. It was magnificent. Yes, I'm sure it is, but every city has a different personality. It is hard to describe. You have to be there. Of course, there are good things and bad things about Orlé, like anywhere else. Sometimes I miss it dearly, and sometimes I'm glad I'm rid of it. And you will laugh at this, but I miss the fine things I had in Orlé. Dresses, fine dresses and furs, and shoes, of course. One can't mingle with nobility with bad shoes, you see. Ole is very fashionable, almost ridiculously so. <gasps> but the shoes! Living with those ridiculous trends was worth it for the shoes. Well, they're... they're shoes. They're pretty. Some of them anyway. When I left Ole, the fashion was shoes with delicate tapered heels and embellishments in the front. A ribbon, perhaps, or embroidery. In soft colors, of course. It was spring. I wouldn't want to run in it, or have to enter battle, but for lounging in a lady's sitting room? Perfect. The shoes made in Orlais were exquisite. Not at all like these clunky fur-lined leather boots you have in Ferelden. Ugh, just look at them. Thank you. It's kind of you to say so, even wearing these mud-covered horrors. They're sturdy shoes, but sometimes a girl just wants to have pretty feet. Oh, I could talk about shoes all day, but we have things to do, don't we? Something you need? Yes? What's on your mind? Of course I do. I love stories far too much to keep them to myself. Everyone should be able to benefit from them, I think. Chantry Law says it is man's pride that created the Darkspawn. In ages past, the mages of the Tevinder Imperium ruled much of the world we know. In their pride, they thought their magics invincible and imagined that they were greater than the Maker himself. So thinking, they invaded his golden city, planning to take it for themselves and depose their own creator. But they were impure and full of sin. And it is with the sin that they tainted the golden city, corrupting it forever. The Maker cursed them, and cast them from his sight. Wherever they went, they spread the taint of their sin. Any land that was touched by the taint became blighted and would suffer no life. Instead, the darkspawn arose to torment us and remind us of our hubris. Of course, Olesians enjoy telling stories. I shall tell you my favorite tale of Aveline, the Knight of Ole. A long time ago, a girl child was born to a farmer. He had hoped for a son, not a daughter, and so he told his wife to abandon the child in the woods. Before the cold could claim her, the baby was found by a tribe of Dalish elves who took pity on the poor mewling thing and raised her as their own. Aveline, for that is what they called her, grew strong and quick and clever under the guidance of the elves. She learned to wield the sword as well as any man, could kill a deer with an arrow at hundred paces, and was as graceful on the back of a horse as she was on foot. Aveline's Dalish guardians saw that she could easily best any Olesian chevalier in battle, and wanted to show the cruel humans the child they had left to die. They bestowed upon her a fine horse and armor, and sent her to prove herself to her people in the Grand Tourney. Now in those days, no woman was allowed to take up arms, 
let alone compete in the Grand Tourney, but Aveline kept her helmet on and was not discovered. Aveline won many events and gained the approval of the adoring crowd. Eventually, she came face to face with the knight Kaleva in the Grand Melee. Aveline had already bested him in the joust, and Kaleva was determined not to lose a second time. Out of desperation to regain his honor, Kaleva tripped Aveline and tossed her to the ground, ripping off her helmet as he did so. Silence fell upon the arena as Aveline was revealed. Kaleva declared the previous competitions invalid. A woman had taken part, and this was not allowed. But the crowd cheered for Aveline. Kaleva was furious, for he had lost to a woman and was now being shamed. Blinded by his rage, he forced Aveline to her knees. Know your place, woman, cried he, and slit her throat. The son of the king, Prince Freyan, was present. He recognized Aveline's skill and bravery and began to see the injustice done to the women in his land. When he was made king, he rewrote the laws of Ole so that women could also become chevalier. He honored Aveline and knighted her after her death. And to this day, any female who is knighted reveres Aveline the Brave, for she is the patron of all women chevalier. I know one, told to me by my mother a long time ago. It always chill me to the bone. Maybe you have heard of Flemeth? Ah, uh, are you sure? Was she the Flemeth of legend? Flemeth, the devour of men. Flemeth, mother of witches. Flemeth, demon touched who dwells in the mists. Well, if Flemeth really exists, she would be very, very old indeed. Ferelden mothers scare their daughters with talk of Flemeth. They say that if you're bad, Flemeth will spirit you away and bind you to her forever. They also say that Flemeth mourns her lost beauty and will steal yours through your looking glass if she catches you. Flemeth's beauty was known throughout the land. She had hair like unto a moonless night, skin as pale as winter's first snow, and eyes as beautiful and perilous as the sea. When she came of age, she came to the attention of the Lord of Hyeva, Conobar, and he took her for his wife. Conobar soon learned that his young bride had the gift of magic. He kept this a secret, for he feared that she would be taken from him. Flemeth stayed with Conobar for some years, and with his blessing, she practiced her art. And then one day, a young poet named Osen came to the castle. Flemeth was captivated by Osin's voice, and he by her beauty, and they fell in love. Flemeth longed to be with her true love, and she and Osin fled from Conobar's lands, seeking refuge in the Kokari wilds with the Chasin tribes. They lived there happily for many a year till the day Flemeth received news that Conobar was dying and longed to see her face one last time. Flemeth's heart swelled with pity for the man who once was her husband and begged Osen to return to Conobar's side with her. But when Flemeth and Osen entered Hyeva, they were captured by Conobar's men and Osen was slain in front of Flemeth's eyes. Flemeth was imprisoned in the highest tower of the castle, there to await Conobar's judgment on her. Distraught at the loss of her love, Flemeth plotted revenge against her husband. She summoned a fey demon, intending for it to wreak vengeance on Conobar. But a spell went awry. The demon possessed Flemeth. Turning her into an abomination, the halls of the castle ran red with blood as Flemeth slaughtered Conobar and all his men. The loss of Flemeth's humanity melted away, and at dawn, she stole back to the wilds to plot and scheme for a hundred years. 
they say she took to her side many chastened men, and with their help, begat her daughter witches, who even now prowl the dark places of the Kokari wilds. Which one? I have heard a little about how the elves gained their freedom from the Tevinter Imperium. When Andraste began her exalted march against the Imperium, the elves joined her cause to fight their masters. The great elven leader, Shatan, born in captivity, rose up to lead his people. He foresaw a future where the elves were free. Shatan was killed when Andraste was betrayed, but the elves continued to fight eventually breaking free of the Imperium. The Elves claimed the Dales in the south and settled there in the land of their own. The Elves lived in the Dales for centuries. They resurrected the worship of the Elven gods and would allow the building of no Chantry. This angered the Chantry, and the hostility between the two factions finally broke out in open war. The Chantry says the Elves struck first, but I do not know whether to believe it. The Chantry declared a wholly exalted march against the Elves, named for Andraste's similar march against the Vinter. During the exalted march of the Dales, the Elven cities were sacked and the Elven state completely dissolved. Some of the Elves bitterly accepted their fates and surrendered to human rule, living in the human cities as second-class citizens. But others, still fiercely proud of their heritage, refused to bow to the humans and instead became homeless wanderers. There were the elves of the Dales, the Dalish. Andraste was the Maker's chosen. The Maker had long since abandoned the world when the sound of her singing turned his ear. Beauty, grace, and wisdom enraptured him, and he offered to take her from this flawed world to become his divine bride. But Andraste had an earthly husband and would not forsake him. Instead, she beseeched the Maker to return to his people once more. So earnest was her plea that the Maker was moved and promised that he would create a paradise on earth if all abandoned their false gods and turned once more to him. And this is why Andraste began her exalted march on the idolaters of the Tevinter Imperium. The Maker granted her his powers with which to smite her enemies. Andraste brought the Imperium to its knees, and her victories converted many to the worship of the Maker. Alas, it was the frailties of men that betrayed and killed Andraste. Her earthly husband, Mafarath, a chieftain of the Alamari tribes himself, grew jealous as his wife's popularity and influence overshadowed his own. She was also revered as the Maker's betrothed and Mafarath began to see their own bond waning in significance as Andraste became ever more devoted to the Maker. Out of envy and spite, Mafarath made a pact with the Archon Hesarian of Tevinter, allowing his beloved Andraste to be ambushed and captured. Andraste was burned at the stake in Minrathus, the capital of Tevinter. <coughs> The Tevinta Chantry claims that in Andraste's last moments, Hesarian's heart softened, and he heard the voice of the Maker telling him to end her suffering. He plunged his sword into her heart, and as her blood washed over his hands, he became one of the faithful. Dissenters said that the Archon only converted because he could not stem the tide of Andraste's cult, and was forced to do so to stay in power. We will never know for sure. Yes? Something you need? Yes? What's on your mind? All right. It is my job to spin yarns after all. Which one? It will come to you soon, I'm sure. Yes? Something you need?
Yes? What's on your mind? Why did you hear this? And you believe everything you hear? <laughs> Not all minstrels are spies. Most are just singers and storytellers. But some of them are... are what we call bards. Many use the two words, minstrel and bard, interchangeably, but to do so in Orlais would cause misunderstanding. Bards are minstrels and more. Spies, as you say. Some say there is a bard order, but I don't think this is true. Many bards work alone or in small groups, doing the bidding of a patron who pays for their services. If there is an organization behind it all, no one knows who they are. Nobles mostly. In Orlais, there is much rivalry amongst the highborn. They fight over land, influence, and the favor of the empress. But they cannot do this openly because it is impolite. And in public, they wear smiling faces and pretend to be civil. In secret, they plot and scheme to destroy each other. It is a game completely meaningless to anyone but its players. <laughs> and I should, shouldn't I, after having spent most of my adult life as one? You've guessed as much, I'm sure. But does it really matter what I was? What's past is past. I found myself in Ferelden and sheltered from bad weather in the Chantry. And when the storm passed, I just did not want to leave. I like to see the Maker brought me here. Yes? Something you need? Mmm, that's an idea. I've watched you, and I do think you'd find some of my skills quite easy to pick up. Let's just go over there, away from the others. For safety, yes? I expect there shall be daggers flying about willy-nilly for a time.
shall be done. It's a trap! As you say, I shall do it. Very well. trap. Very well. Resorting to petty thievery now. How sad. I suggest you watch yourself. When? I don't know if I have the strength for another big battle. The Grey Warden. Hiding the Blight is the least we can do. True. The Circle has always played a part in defeating the Blights. This is our chance to show that we will fight and die for our home, just like any other Ferelden. I dread to think of what might have become of us if you hadn't come along. I think we will be all right now. Thanks to you. The children are already a lot calmer. Oh, come, swift sword, and deliver me that I might find the Maker again. You've rested enough. We need to get these out of the tower before they get fragrant. Touching those abominations. It's wrong. Why do we have to take them across the lake to burn? The lake's right there.
shall be done. As you say. Glad I'm still alive, but the Circle's future still remains to be seen. What was that soup you made for supper last night? Oh, that? That's a traditional Ferelden lamb and pea stew. Do you like it? Oh, so it was lamb then. It had a certain texture I don't normally associate with lamb. They didn't make lamb and pea stew for you in Lothering? We ate simply there. Whole grains made into biscuits or bread, and vegetables from the garden, cooked lightly. No heavy stews. Ah, so the last lamb you had was probably cooked or lesion style. Food shouldn't be frilly and pretentious like that. Now, here in Ferelden, we do things right. We take our ingredients, throw them in the largest pot we can find, and cook them for as long as possible until everything is a uniform grey colour. As soon as it looks completely bland and unappetizing, that's when I know it's done. You're having me on. Ha! <laughs> you need to eat in more Ferelden inns. Welcome back, Warden. As you can see, we've been busy. Clean the place up a bit. Even my brother Mikhail came out of hiding. Never will you find a finer smith. Also, got some goods stored here that might interest you. Buy them now before my cousins move it all someplace else. I thought about it, but I figured that it's not a bad thing to believe that you come from a line of lions, even if the truth is a touch more complicated. Our family's belief that we were wronged, it gave us strength to make something of ourselves. 
King Arlen sounded like a right nasty piece of work. Sophia was branded a traitor. She consorted with blood mages. But in spite of it all, I think she was a hero. We've a big family. When you were away, we all pitched in. Hard to believe there were undead, demons and worse around here, right? I've not a peep from him. Seems to like keeping to himself. But I keep telling the children to stay away from the tower. Certainly. Family owes you a great deal. You? You're the Warden? My family owes you. Any weapons I make, I will sell you for a discount. I have a family full of traders living a soft life, getting fat. I chose to learn the way of metal and stone. It keeps me strong. Indeed, I have spent my life studying steel, dragon bone, and more. I learned all I could in human lands, and exiled dwarves taught me more. Give me the finest metals and materials, and I can make wonders for you. Warden? This... this is star metal. If you give this to me, I will craft for you a thing of legend. Nothing. My family owes you much. And so it shall be. It is done. I call this blade Starfang. May it serve you well. I must rest after my exertions. Warden? I have been studying Mother's Grimoire. Do you wish to hear what I have found? Tis not what I expected. I had hoped for a collection of her spells, a map of the power that she commands. But this is not it. Disturbed? Yes, perhaps that is the right word. One thing in particular within her writings disturbs me. Here, in great detail, Flemeth explains the means by which she has survived for centuries. Oh, if only twere so. Flemeth has raised many daughters over her long lifetime. There are stories of these many witches of the wilds throughout Chastened Legend, Yet I have never seen a one, and always wondered why not. And now I know. They are all Flemeth. 
When her body becomes old and wizened, she raises a daughter. And when the time is right, she takes her daughter's body for her own. Once, Flemeth was a mage. This was before the time of the Circle of Magi, but she wielded magical power of the same sort that all the ancient shamans did. It was no different. She summoned a demon and made it part of her, and became an abomination, one that has thrived. Whether Flemeth has always been the demon, or mastered it, or they are one, I truly do not know. No matter what she is, her body still ages and will not sustain her forever. So she must find new bodies. I am to be the next new body in a very long line. Indeed, that is primarily what this tome details. The various daughters that Flemeth has acquired, their preparation and training. I recognize all of it. I am to be her next host. This is my purpose. Whatever spark of the demon that made her what she is remains within her, keeps her from dying of old age, but her body deteriorates. Eventually, she would be so wizened as to be senseless and immobile. So, she must seek a new body, a fresh body, and start the cycle anew. I am uncertain. According to her writings, certain hosts are better than others. The more a host is prepared, the quicker the transition will be. I am sorry. This simply takes me by surprise. I would have thought I would have had some inkling, some notion. Flemeth is capable of many things. I was a fool not to suspect her capable of using me for her own self-preservation. I do not know. Perhaps tis as she said, the Darkspawn threaten her as much as they threaten anyone else. Or perhaps she believes that this journey will make me more powerful. According to the tome, if the host is already powerful and trained in magic, it takes far less time for Flemeth to settle in. Not by any natural means. Perhaps I should take this as a vote of confidence from her on my capabilities? Or perhaps she simply wished me gone from the Kokari Wilds so she could prepare her ritual in peace. A disturbing thought. There is only one possible response to this. Flemeth needs to die. I will not sit about like an empty sack waiting to be filled. Flemeth must be slain, and I need your help to do it. It may seem so. If you think of Flemeth as a mother, Think of her instead as an ancient abomination that intends to use her own flesh and blood to extend her life beyond all natural limits. She did not wish anyone to get a hold of this information, least of all me. Now I have. If I do not act on what I know, then more the fool am I. Because if she is slain while I am near, I am not certain that she will not simply be able to take possession of me right there. So obviously I cannot be the one to do it. And what would that do? At best I would receive pointless reassurances. At worst, Flemeth would imprison me once she became aware I know what I do. I know my mother well enough to be confident she would show no mercy when it came to her own survival. I must do the same. Then what needs to be done is for you to go back to Flemeth's hut in the Kakari Wilds without me. Confront her and slay her quickly. 
I doubt she will truly be dead even then, but it will take her years to find a new host and recover her power, if that is even possible. The thing I must have is her true grimoire. With it, I can defend against her power in the future. Everything else in her hut is yours. Not really, but the sooner the better, no? <laughs> she would like everyone to think she is invincible, but I highly doubt that is the case. And besides that, you are not truly killing her. I am grateful. The sooner this can be done, the sooner it will set my mind at ease. Something on your mind? Of course. Yes? Something you need? Yes? What's on your mind? Oh, it's been a long day. Rest. Rest would be welcome. Yes, yes, of course. I am just a little weary. As you may have noticed, I'm no spring chicken. Thank you. You're very kind to say so. But in all honesty, I do not know how many years I have left in me. I have lived for such a long time, but there is always something else to do. And I have to keep going in order to do it. I think I will be glad when I am done. Have you encountered many abominations, apart from the ones in the Circle Tower? You are younger than I, and your nerves yet have some steel in them. Did you feel any fear facing the abominations? The first time I saw an abomination, my blood turned to ice. It was months before the nightmares stopped. It was the knowledge that I could easily become one of them that frightened me the most. One slip. All it takes is one slip, and everything you are is simply gone. Replaced by madness, and there is no turning back, or at least that's what they say. Of late, I have begun to wonder if... if there is any way an abomination can be... cured. Or if a mage could be so possessed and still retain their sanity. Their humanity. Because every mage lives with this threat, it is constantly on our minds. Do not trouble yourself, though. This is only an old lady giving voice to her musings. I must ask, what does being a Grey Warden mean to you? I just wanted to know what you thought being a Grey Warden was about. Ultimately, being a Grey Warden is about serving others. About serving all people, whether elves or dwarves or men.
As a Grey Warden, you are a guardian of men. And you guard them because their continued existence is more important than you are. Thus it is you who serves, not they. A good king, a true king who cares for his land, uses his power to rule firmly but fairly. He serves his people first and foremost. The king who does not do this, who believes that he is entitled to his power, who abuses it and uses it for his own means, is a tyrant. And the country suffers for it. If you live apart from others and your actions affect only you, then you may do as you wish. But if you have power, influence, and strength, your every action will be as a drop of water in a clear, still pond. The drop causes ripples, and ripples spread. Think of how far they will go, how wide they will become, how will they affect the pond. But I've lectured enough for today. I should stop before I wear out my welcome. What's on your mind? Oh, yes, and thank you for asking. I'm feeling much better today. Well, thank you for your kindness, my dear. It certainly warms these rickety old bones. What's on your mind? Hmm. Is something troubling you? A Grey Warden should put aside the person that he used to be. It has shaped the person that he is, but he has become something greater. Grey Wardens have no titles. They owe no allegiance to a king or lord. They cannot serve one people. They must serve them all and protect them all. You are one of the two surviving Grey Wardens in Ferelden. You defend all of us, and much rests on your shoulders. It may not mean much to you, but thank you for having the courage to continue to fight. And that gives me hope. Have you heard much about the Grey Wardens of old? It was said that watching the Wardens ride in on their white griffins was enough to rouse a weary heart and put the dance back in the step of an old man. The Grey Wardens were powerful, feared and respected, but they also inspired the common people. I remember a tale that was told to me many years ago. The Blight had ravaged the land for months, and the armies of the great kings had amassed for one last stand. As the sun burst through the clouds that boiled and churned in the dark sky above, it illuminated a vast, seething horde of darkspawn, with the archdemon at its head. And it was then, when courage seemed to fail, and all lost to death and despair, that the Grey Wardens came. They arrived with the beating of wings like mighty war drums, and stood before the armies of men. Yes, Griffins. Now listen to the rest of the story. The Grey Wardens, grim and fearless, marched forth, ever between the men and the encroaching Darkspawn. They formed a shield of their own bodies and held that line until the Archdemon was dead, and the last Darkspawn lay trampled in the dirt, and then demanding neither reward nor recognition for their sacrifice. The Grey Wardens departed 
when the clouds finally rolled back and the sun shone full upon the blighted ground, the great kings knew that they had lost no men and none of their blood had been spilled. You are observant. This is a tale about no battle the Grey Wardens have fought, and yet about them all. They have always defended us from the Darkspawn, taking losses so we do not have to. People may have forgotten over the centuries, but nothing has changed. This knowledge has been blessing and burden to Grey Wardens past, and now it shall be your blessing and your burden. What's on your mind? No, you won't. You wonder sometimes, don't you? If your life would be better if you weren't who you are. When I was a young woman in the tower, I came to the realization that the circle would be my life, and I would know no other. Family, love, a simple life. These were things that others took for granted that I would never have. It made me very moody. All I could think of was being trapped in that tower with no way out and no end in sight. I started hating my life and myself, and one night I found myself in the tower's chapel. I was seeking refuge, maybe answers. I must have looked tearful or made some noise because the revered mother came out and decided to speak to me. And because I had no one else to talk to, I talked to her. I must have said many silly things, but she told me that the Maker puts us all on our paths for a reason, and fighting our intended course is what causes so much anguish. I thought the old biddy was full of rubbish. I was 15, maybe 16, and I knew everything. So I left, but I always found my way back to that chapel. And as the years passed, I began to see the truth of her words. We were supposed to be polar opposites, mage and priest. But we weren't. There was much about us that was the same. The revered mother had lived in the Chantry all her life, as I had been in the tower for all of mine. She taught me that you can find your family in the people around you, that you can love your work and find fulfillment in duty. And there is joy 